Well, you've heard Penny's brief introduction to Kyle Kingsbury, but I'm going to give you a little of my own. As you guys can imagine, I've worked with a lot of the best athletes in the world. Some of them I can't mention due to secrecy contacts, contracts for various reasons, but many of them you'll have seen many times on television. Some of them have shoes named after them and all sorts of cool stuff. Many world record holders. Laird Hamilton is a longtime friend and client of mine. And of all the men I've ever related to and spent time with, I'd have to say Laird Hamilton is one of the strongest, most powerful personalities I've ever met. But Kyle Kingsbury can stand right next to him. If you've never met Kyle, he's a tall, very strong, good-looking, full-on alpha male. Yet, he hugs me and he kisses me and I hug him and I kiss him because I just have deep, honest love and respect for him. And it's very exciting for me to be able to share him with you today. And what I want to do for all of you is take you on the hero's journey and let Kyle share his journey, his path to becoming a man and to engaging the hero's journey fully. And I know from my experience and time with Kyle that he has seen the dark edges of the caves. He has looked into the eyes of the devil. He's met himself. He was a professional cage fighter for many years. I've seen pictures of him with his eye just smashed shut blood. He's had his jaw broken. He's, you know, and I'm, I'm a guy that grew up in a boxing ring. I fought on the third ranked amateur boxing team in the world. Uh, my sparring partner for many years was Lloyd Anderson, who was the world champion in kickboxing in 1986. And so I've been around badasses. This guy is a real fucking badass. But he's got a heart that's as big as his power reaches. Kyle... Welcome to Living 4D. Fuck yeah. It's amazing to be here, brother. I love you. I love you, brother. So, Kyle, I really want to take people on a journey with you because you have really lived and you do really live and you have one of the most beautiful wives I've ever seen who's mm -hmm. intelligent and you guys have a beautiful child and so you're a father you understand the responsibilities of family. Um, you don't live in the, you know, the standard Christian marital box, as, as nor do I. So you're on the hero's journey there. Whenever we go outside of the box, you know, pioneers can always be seen by the arrows in their backs. And as we talked about in our previous episode together for your podcast, Great Minds. Great Minds always meet violent opposition by mediocre minds, as Einstein said. So what I want to do just to start us off is I'm going to outline the hero's journey for those that aren't familiar with the stages of it. <clears throat> now, for you listening, I'm going to give you a brief synopsis of each of the stages that I will then ask Kyle to expand on in his own experience as it relates to the stage, so you will actually learn the structure of the hero's journey that was created by Joseph Campbell quite some time ago. You can read his book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces, which is incredible and comprehensive, to really go deeper into the hero's journey if you want. But if we break the 12 stages that the hero's journey is often presented in, into four phases. Part one is called the call to adventure. It includes the ordinary world, the call to adventure, the refusal. Part two is the supreme ordeal or the initiation. There you meet the mentor or helper. You cross the threshold. 
you are tested, you find out who your allies and enemies are. Then you enter part three, the unification and transformation. The stages there are the approach, the ordeal, and the reward. And then we go to part four, the road back, the hero's return. And the stages are the road back, the atonement, and the return. So Kyle, <clears throat> we're going to begin with part one, the ordinary world. The synopsis of this stage is, this is where the hero exists before his present story begins, oblivious to the adventures to come. It's his safe place, his everyday life, where we learn crucial details about our hero, his true nature, capabilities, and outlook on life. This anchors the hero as a human, just like you and me, and makes it easier for us to identify with him and hence later empathize with his plight. So Kyle, to begin with, tell us who you were, about your family upbringing, what were some of the challenges in your development, yeah. your parenting, um, you know, who was Kyle before Kyle really even knew he was going to enter the hero's journey? Well, let's see. I grew up in the Bay Area in Northern California. Uh, I have one sister who's a year younger than me. And parents uh, stayed married till they were till I was 13, then got a divorce, but lots of fighting in the house. Um, not really a lot of physical violence, but a lot of verbal violence and throwing shit. So I guess that's physical, but, you know, people weren't getting beat at least. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, it was very – it was hard – to, to see that, to be a part of that, and also to see my sister take that on mm -hmm. in a way. And uh, I'm deeply connected mm -hmm. to my sister. We're very close in age and in spirit, but I think there was, there was a lot to that. I also struggled in school, as you did. Mm -hmm. um, not so much academically. I did very well on tests. I just didn't fucking care for the work. Yeah. I didn't want to learn it, so I wouldn't do homework. I would refuse book reports and various assignments and do whatever I could just to pass mm -hmm. and um, fought a lot growing up. I think that was really some of the most peaceful points in my life. And, you know, reading books like Stealing Fire and The Rise of Superman and things like that, you realize like, oh, I was, I was chasing a flow state. Mm -hmm. I didn't have fear of home. I didn't have fear of anything going on in that moment other than being 100% present. And I didn't know that would lead to fighting later, but in, mm -hmm. in that time growing up, I think those were some of the best moments of my life. What triggered the fights? What was the common theme that led to uh, altercations? Well, I mean, I was really tall and thin, and so I looked older than I was. Um, <laughs> believe it or not, my mom dressed me for quite some time, so I'd have a lot of older kids picking on me for the clothes that I wore. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm gonna fuck you up, preppy, you know? Yeah. And, and, you know, the Bay Area, it's it's the Silicon Valley. People know it for Apple computers and places like that, but there's a lot of hard edges, you know, in mm -hmm. different towns, even in some of the nicer places now that have come up. Uh, it wasn't all the, always that way when I was growing up. So a lot of kids would fight there. And um, yeah, it'd be pretty much be, I'd feel like I was backed into a corner and that was the last option. Yeah. And there was plenty of times where I would just sprint and run away. You yeah. Know, if, I, if I was outnumbered or... Fight or flight, I was going to lose. Yeah. Yeah. So there, I mean, plenty equal to as many fights as I was in, I was running. Mm -hmm. So, but very often I'd get the chance to square off with somebody. And those are beautiful experiences. I mean, they, they taught me a lot about myself, but also really it was my first taste of quiet mind. It was my first taste of inner mm -hmm. stillness. Yeah. It's amazing how when you're facing a storm, it, uh, it can have a centering effect on you. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it does for everybody. I think some of us come with the equipment to deal with, you know, threats to our, our sense of self or threats to our physical well-being or threats to our family. I remember... You know, my stepfather was a violent man, and um, there was times he was just beating my mother and blood coming out of her face from getting hit in the mouth or something. And 
I was just a little boy, and me and my brother would just go full on at him with every thing we could get our hands on, throw stuff at him. And, you know, this guy was, you know, about your size. He was an ex-professional rodeo rider, 6'4", 220, and one mean, powerful son of a bitch. But there was something inside of me that was less concerned about my survival and more concerned about protecting my mother and sometimes my brothers and sisters. So I, my point is I think some of us come equipped to deal with the uh, the intensity of combat and some of us just go into freeze mode and and, you know, God bless whatever happens at that point. You either get eaten or the storm blows by and you go, oh, my God, I made it. So that sort of sets the stage, gives us a little bit about your, your development. Um, one of the things I want to ask before we move forward is, how was your relationship with your father in your early years, your developmental years? It, was, uh, it wasn't good. I feared him. Um, <clears throat> there was a lot there. I mean, I, there, don't get me wrong. There was plenty of amazing experiences. One of the things that I love about my father, and I've, I've, you know, as we get into plant medicines later on in this talk, one of the things I saw when I had my first visions of my father was how much he played with us. Mm -hmm. He would fucking always play. He'd wrestle with me. Um, massage my legs when I had growing pains, throw mm. three flies up for fucking 10 hours on a Saturday. Mm. You know, like those were, those were very much beautiful memories. Uh, but as with life, we remember the shit sometimes more than the good. Mm -hmm. And I think um, the communication, you know, we were talking about on my podcast, nonviolent communication, whatever the opposite of that is, yeah. that's how, how we talked, how, the, how we were spoken to in the house. And, um, I really didn't have a good relationship with my dad until my parents got divorced. And mm. I kind of saw, I saw the writing on the wall early. My mom had talked with me about potentially getting a divorce when I was 10. Mm -hmm. And I was like, fuck yeah, let's go. Like, <laughs> what are you waiting for? You guys are not meant to be together. Right. You're like two rams. Yeah. No one gives here. No one's giving, um, no one's giving in. No one's receding. Nobody's saying like, there's no apology, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and so with that, finally, my parents do get divorced, and it's like a weight's lifted off my dad's shoulders. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have the stress of trying to hold the family together. He doesn't have the stress of trying to make it all work. He has a, an exact dollar amount he's got to pay her, an exact dollar amount he's got to give for us, and we get to see him often. Um, we got an apartment not far from us, and my whole relationship dynamic changed them at that point when I was 13. I think he really started to treat me more like a man, and even though there was no rites of passage or coming of age ceremony, uh, we began to see eye to eye in a lot of ways and and have deeper conversations, you know? And I, I could feel that change. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, it's funny because I was, there was a lot of pushback with my mom at that point, and that's where <laughs> her and I had uh, a lot of work to do because it's hard, very hard for a mom to raise two kids and really to, alone. You know, she has to yeah. take over the father role because he's yeah. not around. Yeah. And um, I think my dad, <clears throat> knowing he wasn't going to see us all the time, he disciplined me less because of that. He didn't want to have to have that role when we would see each other mm -hmm. um, on the lesser time scale that we did. My mom having to take that on, there was a lot of resistance on that part because I'm like, I don't, I didn't enjoy school. I didn't enjoy a lot of what life was bringing me. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of resistance and pushback to authority. And certainly that was the case with my mom. So she probably got it worse in the teenage years than my dad did, but it allowed me to see like, I can move forward. It's, I'm not, I'm not a victim of anything that happened when I was younger. I can create something new and I have created brand new relationships with both my parents. That's beautiful. Yeah. <clears throat> Some of some people are, as you know, are not so fortunate. The the early rifts just get deeper and deeper. Um, I, I know for myself that getting to the point where I could forgive my father and realize that I couldn't have become the person that I am without 
the hard training he gave me. It was as though he was preparing me for and giving me the work ethic that I would have to have in order to accomplish the work that I've accomplished in my lifetime. And it was a big weight off my shoulder to come to the point where I could just see the beauty that I couldn't see before because it took a lot of anger out of me, mm -hmm. you know, so that was important. The second stage is the call to adventure. The hero's adventure begins when he receives the call to action, such as a direct threat to his safety, his family, his way of life, or to the peace of the community in which he lives. It may not be as dramatic as a gunshot, but simply a phone call or a conversation but whatever the call is and however it manifests itself, it ultimately disrupts the comfort of the hero's ordinary world and presents a challenge or a quest that must be undertaken. When did the call to adventure come for you, and what was it? Well, it came... <laughs> I'm not fucking giggling right now because of how much this applies and pertains to my life. Um, <clears throat> Definitively, without question, it came at the end of my college football career. I had played football since I was 10 years old. I loved being an athlete. I loved the camaraderie of team sports. And it's all I knew and it's all I wanted to do. It's the reason I went to college. I didn't give a shit about learning new things. And I enjoyed communication and sociology and the things that I learned at ASU just to stay eligible. Mm -hmm. But that was it. And so when it ended... Um, what position did you play? Defensive end and defensive tackle. Okay. And I was a lot bigger then. Um, like 268 was as big as I got. And I'm about 216 right now. Nice and nice and svelte. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, but you're, still, <laughs> you're still pretty solid customers. So um, whoever used to get hit by you must have been in pain. <laughs> it was a good time. It was a great time. When it ended, and I knew my, you know, I set the bench at ASU. I didn't get a lot of playing time. There was no hopes of going pro. I knew guys that had started every game all four years and didn't go pro. It's wow. a big fucking jump yeah. from high school to college and yeah. an even bigger jump from to D1 pro. to pro. Yeah. So knowing that um, and not really seeing anything else on the wall athletically, this is long before I thought about becoming a fighter, I got really depressed. you know. And I looked around. Uh, a lot of the classes I had taken weren't fun anymore. It was now just shit that I needed to do to finish off my degree. And I, I just thought, fuck it. What am I going to get a degree for so I can get a job in sales like both my parents? Both my parents worked on 100% commission. Mm -hmm. That is a fucking high stress way to live. It is, yeah. Because no one has consistent pay coming in. Right. And um, I didn't want that for myself. You know, and it really looked like my degree in basket weaving was going to lead to that. <laughs> and I have no, this is, I'm not shitting on anyone in sales people. There's, it can be something that's very fulfilling, mm -hmm. you know, and, and very, if you're, if you're a driven person and you like that, that chase and that fire, that's a great thing. But if you're, I'm a fiery fucking person, I mean, I'll bet it would burn me alive. Yeah. So I saw the writing on the wall of what it meant to finish college and go into a job like that. I also, at the time, had partied a lot. Arizona State was the number one party school in the nation. Partying is a slang term used for cocaine and various other drugs. So, you know, at that time in my life, I was putting things in my body that were having a direct response on my mood, my emotional state, lack of sleep, you name it, all contributed to or, or in in at the same time with a lack of drive, a lack of purpose, a lack of meaning, mm -hmm. and really seeing a future that I didn't want for myself uh, became extremely depressed. And it even came to the point where I attempted suicide. Really, I didn't know that. And I was gonna say, you realize what you're describing right now is the situation for a massive amount of the males in our culture right now. Hmm. It really is. Yeah, yeah. So the the, when you attempted suicide, what was the justification inside of yourself? Well, I had, had kind of hit rock bottom with the roller coaster of drugs, seeking pleasure in all the wrong places. Um, I had a girlfriend at the time 
that if I was myself in front of, you know, and it's kind of a, and I shouldn't say myself, one angle of myself is to be loud and funny and obnoxious. And it didn't resonate with her at all. And I just felt like I'm showing a piece of me here and she doesn't love that piece of me. Mm -hmm. So that, will that mean, will anybody ever love me for who I am? And I think that was the deeper thing was realizing like, will I ever be loved? I love you. <laughs> I got lots of love right now, brother. But yeah. um, at that time, I didn't feel it. So I took every pill that I had, Vicodin, Xanax, Valium, down the mall, drove to the top of parking lot seven at ASU. It's about, fuck, I don't know how tall it is. It's about seven stories up, seven layers. Got to the top, stripped down naked, and, and stood on the ledge to jump. And I wasn't a religious person. I had been to church as a kid, but a lot didn't resonate with me, as we've discussed many times. Mm -hmm. But in that moment, I just felt a wash come over me of warm, and it felt like pure love mm -hmm. coming through. And I heard, not yet. That was it. Then I heard, hey, what are you doing up there? <laughs> Security guard spotted me going up late at night, thought it was a little wonky, and he talked me down. And, and uh, Your guardian angel dressed as a security guard? Yep. And uh, I snapped out of it 48 hours later in a, what my mom calls the loony bin. Was a little, well, you, all them drugs must have come on and just yep. made a mess of you. Yeah. I had uh, Apparently, I was not nice to the male nurse either, so I'm sure. <laughs> I wasn't getting great treatment in there. No. But... Um, you know, coming out of that, I spent a week in the hospital with other people who had some pretty serious mental illness, you mm -hmm. know, and a lot of them were looking at me like, I'm fucking 25 years old, I'm in shape, um, look handsome, and uh, at least from their opinion, and um, they were confused. They were like, you, my family had flown out from California to Arizona to be with me. You know, they're like, your fucking whole family's here. Mm -hmm. You're in college. You're an athlete. What the fuck are you depressed for? Yeah. You know, but, and that's something that taught me right then. I understood in that moment, it doesn't matter what the circumstance is. It is perspective. It is perspective. It's it is relative. Perspective. It is relative, right? Yeah. So if it matters to me, then it matters. It, it doesn't, might not matter to someone else, but you know, people in other different circumstances might look at my life and be like, fuck, you should have gratitude. Yeah. And they're right to a degree, but it is how you view it. And at mm -hmm. that point in time, I needed something else. It was tough. But coming out of that, I realized like, maybe I shouldn't uh, be putting this shit in my body. Maybe it is having an effect on me. Mm -hmm. And I went to a psychologist and a psychiatrist and I was already averse to the psychiatrist because their job is to give you drugs. Mm -hmm. And the psychologist I had had, you know, I've been, been to therapy since I was seven years old. So I was kind of, I was kind of into it. I was like, all right, that's cool. And the psychologist really didn't tell me shit. He didn't help me out at all. He had similar, you know, like, what are you doing here? Kind of attitude. The psychiatrist, I told him, I don't want any drugs. I tried lithium. I tried this other shit. I feel like a fucking mute. I don't want any drugs at all. And he said, why don't you try taking fish oil? And he gave <laughs> That's me, pretty cool. He gave me fucking six studies that I think were out of Europe that showed how it affects the brain and cognitive performance and mood. And so I started taking fish oil. And that was really where I got into a deeper dive of there's a direct correlation between what I put in my body and how I feel and really being mindful of that. That's amazing. Now, wh when you said you were seeing counselors from seven years of age, what were you seeing the counselors for? Fighting, getting into trouble. Okay. Yeah, getting sent to the principal's office constantly. You know, every every week I was in the principal's office. So yeah, I have some experience with suicide. By the way, my brother committed suicide when he was thirty four. I, I think remember that. I was thirty four. Maybe he was thirty four and I was thirty five. But it, it's a very very painful thing when someone in their, your family commits suicide. Um, and there's been other deaths in the family. So I've walked down these paths myself. And, uh, you know, I'm sure glad you didn't jump because <laughs> I wouldn't get nearly as many hugs and kisses from a man. And it's really special when you can... Don't you find it special when you can get love from a man that has no strings attached to it, has nothing to do with being sexually you know, out of the box. It's just, 
respect for a warrior. Yeah. That's what warm. you give me. Yeah, brother. I got all the respect in the world for you. Thank you. Our next stage is the reverse uh, refusal of the call. Although the hero may be eager to accept the quest, at this stage he will have fears that need overcoming. Second thoughts or even deep personal doubts as to whether or not he is up to the challenge. When this happens, the hero refuses the call, and this may result in suffering somehow. The problem he faces may seem too much to handle, and the comfort of home may be more attractive than the perilous road, of he road ahead. <clears throat> this would also be our own response. Excuse me. This would also be our own response, and once again, this helps us bound further with the reluctant hero. So we never really did get clear what the call was for you that ultimately took you into the hero's journey where you had to deal with the realities of the challenges of the hero's journey. So what was the call to adventure that ultimately took you beyond the depressive, suicidal, football player, drug-doing, party-doing that somehow cultivated a sense of meaning and purpose that drove you to become against the odds. What was that call? Fighting, without a doubt. And I didn't know it yet. That's why I hadn't brought it up yet. I didn't know it at that point. And was there a refusal at any point? Yes. So after the attempted suicide, there was probably, I want to say, six months to a year before I actually made my way into an MMA gym. And I pussyfooted around the idea, talked about it, and weighed the pros and cons. And, well, I fought a lot growing up, but... It's different when you're in the heat of moment and it's survival versus somebody who's a fucking trained killer who's training for you specifically and yeah. it's in front of a bunch of people and it's for fucking peanuts for money. Yeah. Um, Whose but, idea was that? Well, for you to become a fighter. I wanted to train just for the sake that I, I weightlifting and fucking running on a treadmill. I felt like I was a rat on the wheel. Yeah. It wasn't doing it for me. I wasn't training with a hundred guys with music blasting and a fucking division one strength coach. Who's now the head strength coach for the Carolina Panthers football team. Like that didn't exist. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I wanted something where I'd be, have a deeper connection. I wanted the human interaction mm -hmm. and martial arts was going to give me that. So about three months into training, in a gym, the guy who owned the gym also ran a small local promotion in Arizona, Rage in the Cage. And um, he was like, look, dude, you're big, you're good looking, you should fight, you know? And if you don't like it, you don't ever have to do it again. If you do like it, you know, you keep going. And uh, I won my first two fights in under 30 seconds and was absolutely hooked. <laughs> Uh-oh. Like, All right, let's- <laughs> I got the bait. Yeah, let's start, let's start training a little bit more then. Um, and it's, it's, it's amazing to tell this story because at that point I had a strength coach who, you know, he's, a, he's got a thick New York accent. He's like, you fought a lot. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what? He goes, you fought a lot. And I was like, I fart a lot. That's a fucking weird thing to say to a man. <laughs> and he's like, no, I'm serious. You got an intolerance. And I was like, I got an intolerance to what? And he's like, it's probably wheat. And so he fucking introduced me to you. We watched Flatten Your Abs Forever on VHS. Wow. And so- I didn't realize this was part of your fighting training. This this came into the fight game and changed the way I viewed everything about what I put in my body and also really planted the seed for me to want to learn. Period. So I actually contributed to your fighting career. <laughs> you contributed my whole life, brother. Oh my God, no wonder we kiss each other. <laughs> so, you and know, how I long ago course, was that? Fuck, this was 2006. Okay, yeah. So yeah, so I read How to Eat, Move Me Healthy. I do all the questionnaires and I fucking, of course, come out on the other side of that thing like, man, I got this, 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 and this. I got <laughs> candida. I got fucking gluten intolerance <laughs> and started cleaning stuff up. And from that point on, I, it, you know, we talked about this on, on the podcast we just did for Human Optimization Hour was that what Waldorf does for kids is it teaches them to love to learn. Yes. Right. So reading that book taught me, oh, this has a huge impact on how I feel, how I recover, fucking all of it, not just performance, which mm -hmm. is really what I was geared towards, but life in general. Yes. And that made me want to learn more. So I've read more books in my fight career than I ever did in college and high school and prior to that, just yeah. because 
there was this great test ahead of me. Yes. Every so often, somebody's mm-hmm. going to try to kill me. Yes. And the better, the more I can learn, the better I can be in recovery in all aspects, the more that's going to help me with this career. And so that, that was the fire that got lit under my ass. You were the fire that lit under my ass to want to learn more and be the better version of myself. You know, I never really fully understood that till right now. Isn't it just, to me, it blows my mind when I talk to, you know, athletes like yourself and people around the world that tell me very similar stories. I've, you know, J.P. Sears, Mm -hmm. when he first came to class with me a long time ago, 17 or more years ago now, told me in class, he said, you know, I was asking everyone to introduce themselves as I often do. And he, and he starts off by saying, well, you know, I was in exercise and sports science in university and I hated it. It was boring as hell. And he said, so I started, a, a personal trainer turned me on to your scientific back and scientific core training. And he says, it was just so understandable and I could see the direct application. So he said, I was carrying the manuals from your courses into my university classes and I was reading them. And every now and then my teacher would catch me and give me shit. And then I realized I was just in the wrong place and I had to come be a Czech professional. So I've heard a number of stories and it's interesting because I hated learning too until I found something inside of myself where that sense of meaning emerged. And I, Mm. I, I then said, ah, I can help people. I can see things that other people don't see. And that triggered off the intense desire because like you i hated homework it was my honor to never do homework i didn't care how much trouble i got and it was like i had to rebel because to me there was something wrong with the school system Mm -hmm. it wasn't designed for people that are action oriented go get or get the job done it was just too much theoretical bullshit i'm like i don't give a damn about how many rubber trees there are in India? How does that help me make a living? I need to go make a living because I got to get the fuck out of my parents' farm. <laughs> but So that's very, very exciting. So you, you had the refusal. It took you a while. Now, how long were you an amateur fighter before you became pro? I started with pro. Oh my God. So yeah. you just went right into the, yeah, <laughs> to the right, fire, baby. I didn't, I didn't think about having a career at that point. So no sense in having amateur fights. I, I really did think of it as I'll try it once. And if I do well, we'll see where I go. And mm-hmm. it just took it fight by fight. Um, and this maybe, went on for nine years, didn't it? Uh, eight years. Yeah. yeah. Eight years professional, six years, last six were in the UFC. And, and how far up the rankings did you get? I, I was sniffing the top 10, but you know, I, it was really a story of peaks and valleys. When I was in the UFC, I kind of lost my way in, but they saw potential and I had a lot of great teammates at American Kickboxing Academy up north in San Jose. So they, they gave me another shot and uh, I had a four fight win streak with a 30 second knockout and two fight of the night victories and then went on a four fight losing streak mm-hmm. <laughs> right before I retired. Great spirit really does test us even in the old fighting ring, doesn't mm-hmm. doesn't no he doubt. or she? <laughs> and you know, yeah, it's uh, you learn a lot about yourself fighting. You really, I I learned a lot about myself. Yeah, you know what I learned the most? Hmm. I don't want to hurt people anymore. Hmm. You know, when I was twenty four, I won't sidetrack the interview, but I'll say I had a deep spiritual experience. I took a guy out to win the championship of the 82nd Airborne Division, which is a big deal for an army fighter. But I detached his retina. And uh, after that, I I went into a a deep spiritual crisis because I felt like for the first time in my life, I had to hunt a guy because he was so good. And I knew at any minute this guy could take me out and I had to stop him. And I, I just something shifted in me. Something went from being um, a sportsman to a hunter. And when I damaged him, I remember when I hit him, it felt like my hand went right through his head and it kind of freaked me out. But then I realized something inside me, a switch flipped. And I remember sitting in the, in the 
locker room crying for a good three hours and all the team members were coming and congratulating me and they couldn't, they were confused as to why I was crying. Mm. And um, I made a decision that day. I was never going to use my, the power inside of me to harm people. I had to use it to help people or something inside of me was going to break. I was not going to do well in the world. I just knew. So all I'm really sharing from my own perspective, you learn a lot about yourself when you're fighting and you know one of you may not come out of that square. Yeah. This is not, this is not, um, you know, going to the local gym with 16 ounce gloves. You know, people do not come out of there sometimes or they come out forever damaged. And I've seen people be permanently damaged for sure. The next stage, number four, is meeting the mentor. At this crucial turning point where the hero desperately needs guidance and meets a mentor figure who gives him something he needs, or this is the crucial point at which he meets a mentor that gives him something he needs, he could be given an object of great importance, insight to the dilemma he faces, wise advice, practical training, or even self-confidence. Whatever the mentor provides the hero with, it serves to dispel his doubts and fears and give him the strength and courage to begin his quest. Who were or was your mentor or mentors that gave you that missing piece or pieces to uh, give you the inner security that you could continue on the hero's journey? There was two. One, I just mentioned, and this isn't to butter your nuts because we're on your podcast, but you were that. I'm, I'm still health. blown away by that. <laughs> butter those nuts. My and nuts then, uh, are feeling good right now. <laughs> um, the They're second, old. <laughs> the second was my boxing coach, a man named Huitzi, who passed away a few years ago, still has a tremendous in impact on my life to this day. Um, he was Mexican and Native American. He would take me to the Native American reservation in Northern California for traditional sweat lodges. That's beautiful. And that's um, a mentor right there. Yeah, massive. You know, we would do that before every fight camp to kind of hone in and, and get our minds right, <clears throat> really focus in on what we want to accomplish in the camp and in the fight. And then after every fight, win or lose, to heal, to let go, and to to focus on bringing something new in. After Quite a few of those, I asked them, you know, when are we going to start using La Medicina? And uh -huh. he just started laughing. And he said, I've been waiting, waiting for you to ask. So he introduced me to, and I had taken mushrooms and things like that um, prior, like a jackass kid just trying to get high. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes those were bad trips. I have air quotes around that because I yeah. don't, I would agree that there are no bad trips if done proper. But um, he taught me how to utilize the plants with respect and reverence, with intention, um, with prayer. And, you know, you've done sweat lodges before. Yep. That each round is a prayer round with a different uh, intention behind it and really facilitated me going through the medicine path and uh, cultivated my first 12 ayahuasca experiences, um, which really shifted the way I was viewing the world and how... I was viewing myself. I think football was always an outlet for me as a kid and an outlet for my aggression that was like a legal way for me to get off and, and dump some of that anger and pain that I had. Fighting continued that for me. Um, it didn't, it wasn't a direct cause for healing though. Mm -hmm. and I still had a lot of unpacked shit yeah from growing up mm -hmm. and from violence can only world. take you so far into healing that's one of the yeah. reasons i had to stop yeah and so you know there was a time where i had a this is fucking oh man this timeline's coming in clear now in 2012 i fought and fractured the whole left side of my face left orbital blowout uh left eyebrow fractures against jimmy manawa in nottingham england and it came back that was my third loss in a row and i remember thinking if I ever got to be a 500 fighter, same fucking baseball. I'm not going to continue. Like there's too much on the line. I, I want to have a brain and eventually wanted to have kids and be able to read to them and do all the shit my dad did with me to play, you mm -hmm. know. And um, 
So I had some soul searching to do. And thankfully, I had these amazing tools. I had mm. access to ayahuasca. I had access to psilocybin. I had access to the Temes calls. And um, I think in doing those those journeys, I was really able to unpack some things. And it's it's funny because I I fought again uh, two years later in 2014 because I, I was getting so many downloads on the self through, you know, I'd just taken HLC1 in San Francisco. Wow. Angie, your wife, it was her first fucking time teaching. She's a great teacher. Eh? Yeah, she's incredible. And <laughs> um, it's funny because I pulled her aside in between one of the things. I was like, if you, it's, you know, you guys are saying a lot of stuff that kind of is familiar with me. Have you guys ever done ayahuasca? And she's like, yeah, we have. And I was like, oh, fuck yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, like that, there was a time for me to have space necessary. Mm -hmm. And then what I wanted to do, I think the reason I fought again is because I wanted to test all this shit. Yeah. Fighting is the greatest test on earth. Yeah. Like you can know how to meditate. You can know how to quiet your mind. But can you do that when somebody's trying to knock you out? Yes, right? exactly. So I wanted to put that on the line. And of course, as, as, uh, as fate would have it, I went out and got the shit kicked out of me in my last fight with my tail in between my legs. I, I left a sport. And I did an ayahuasca ceremony immediately following, asking why the fuck did I need that? Mm -hmm. And it showed me really this dynamic of how I had lived in perfect health in the fight camps, meditating every day, doing Tai Chi or Qigong, breath work, uh, reading good books, not watching TV, and eating incredibly clean, organic, good food, no gluten, nothing bad for me, mm -hmm. right? I'm not saying it's bad for everyone, but not bad for me. And then after the fight, now I'd been a good boy for eight weeks, it's party time. Mm. So I'd still celebrate with bad drugs. I'd mm. still celebrate with shitty food. Mm -hmm. And I'd still go back to watching garbage television. Very common for fighters. You know, I've worked with lots of fighters in my career. I trained the Army boxing team. I trained the international military boxing team. Uh 11 of the 12 fighters on the 1988 Olympic boxing team came from boxing teams that I was the trainer of which is pretty radical when you think about it because they all had to fight their way onto the Olympics as individuals. But I used to watch guys. I've, I remember one of my buddies, Ron Wallstrom, gained 15 pounds in one night after a tournament, and he got <laughs> stretch marks all over his body after right. that. But, you know, the seeing fighters jump into junk food and piles of beer and pizza till they're gorged out of their minds and three banana splits, that's just kind of inherent to the polarity and i believe that that's because to get your weight down and to have the discipline it creates so much pressure and and so much our control function has to be so strong to keep us from wandering off the path of the warrior that once the once the hair comes down, man, it's like you have to be as off as you were on. <laughs> and so it creates this huge polarity, which leads to lots of health problems for fighters. Yeah, it was an issue. But the beautiful thing was ayahuasca showed me I don't need a fight in eight weeks or at some specific date to live that way. And the beauty of ayahuasca, as you know, is it can be very nauseating. It can be very purgative. Mm -hmm. And ayahuasca oscillated back and forth for pretty much the whole fucking evening of me being sick and having visions of partying and eating shit and putting garbage in my body. And I would fucking purge it out. Mm -hmm. And they would oscillate back to how I felt zen as fuck in the fight camp, yeah. eating clean, doing the breath work, feeling charged and just energetically on fire like i was alive in those moments mm. and i was dead in the other moments and it went back and forth enough for me to just beg for mercy like please i, I get the message let me out of this yeah and um and thankfully there was some mercy and and i came out of that fine but I, that stuck with me you know i realized right then like i can treat myself better and i can do it all the time yeah and that to me at the end of the fight career was the huge shift in how I live 365 days a year. I think you might have just given us the next phase, which is crossing the threshold. Well, let's check. <laughs> the hero is now ready to act upon his call to adventure and truly begin his quest, whether it be physical, spiritual, or emotional. He may go willingly or he may be pushed, but either way, he finally crosses the threshold between the world of his familiar 
and that which he is not. It may be leaving home for the first time in his life or just deciding that it's something he's always been scared to do. However, the threshold presents itself. His action signifies the hero's commitment to his journey and wherever it may take him, he goes. So we, we, we've kind of got the threshold. You cross the threshold. You decided that you would give pro fighting a chance. But you've also described a second threshold, and, and that threshold was crossed in the ayahuasca ceremony, and that was, why am I doing this? I've lost four times now. Something's not right. I trained really well. I was really focused. You know, let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. What would have happened if you would have won? Where would you be right now? I've looked back on that many, many fucking times, and I have immense gratitude that I lost and I lost the way that I did, that it wasn't close. You know, if I had eked out, even if I had lost a very close fight, I might still be doing it. You yeah. Know? And uh, like I said, thankfully having the tools allowed me to shift gears and move into helping others, you know, move into something that was more meaningful. And I wasn't sure what that was. I worked at a you, you, we talked about this before on a podcast back in the day, but you brought up the prostitute archetype. Yes. And the prostitute archetype used incorrectly would be, say, a stripper in a strip club who hates her job, but then doesn't like being groped by men, but will keep doing it because the money's good yeah. and will do it until the day she can't because she's 50 years old and no one yeah. wants her to strip anymore. She's the, losing the, her soul. Yeah, the prostitute archetype used correctly is you're doing that shitty job that you don't want to do, but you realize this can afford me some privileges. Maybe I can put a little bit of money away and pay for an education, or maybe this is all I need to get by right now while I learn. Yes. And then I can take that knowledge to the next thing that I really want to do that I am passionate about. And I would work 11-hour shifts until 3.30 a.m., not – the best people, not the best environment. I worked it the whole time I was in the UFC because I was Doing making, what? Uh, bouncing and bartending at a strip oh, club. Oh, okay. So you were still kind of fairly close to the violence. Yeah. And still choking people out, still kicking people out of bars, still mm -hmm. dodging beer bottles to the head. And um, at that point, I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. I didn't know what I was going to do post-fight career. But it wasn't like when I had left football. I wasn't lost. Right. I had I had a sense of purpose and direction. Mm -hmm. I just wasn't sure how that was going to manifest at that point. All I knew is that I was so passionate about things that fucking move the needle for me. Mm -hmm. Health and wellness, lifestyle choices, plant medicines, meditation, all these things. And it just kind of fell into my lap as a lot of things do. But Rogan invited me on his podcast. Oh, wow. And uh, we talked about all the things we're talking about now. And then he, he just told me at the end, like, you got to start your own podcast. That took some work. There was a refusal there. There you go. Another hero's <laughs> journey. And got into podcasting. And uh, as it would have it, that led me to Paleo FX, where I met Aubrey Marcus. And mm. Aubrey and I, by chance, which doesn't exist, shared the same flight home, uh, talked plant medicines and, and all the things for three hours. And he offered me a job and on it. Well, you see, all of that stuff was preparing you. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the messages I'll share at this point. Two messages I'll share at this point because we're halfway through the hero's journey. One, if you're in a down and out place right now, it's a call to trust that there's something deeper going on than your conscious ego can grab a hold of. Haven't you ever looked back at your life and all of a sudden realized there was some kind of a golden thread connecting all these events together? And you realize, oh my God, I was being guided and directed the whole time. It was just me that wasn't paying attention. No doubt. Right? And that's kind of the beauty of growing up. You get to the point where you realize when the storm comes, it's better to just get real quiet inside, drop down into your heart and ask, that invisible guide, what do I do now? And if you don't have access to that invisible guide, then that's the homework. Or you might end up fighting too many times or crashing your car or 
jumping off the ledge or mm -hmm. beating your wife up and abusing your kids to deal with your stress. And, you know, I was in the 82nd Airborne Division where there's a lot of badasses and I had friends that were in Delta Force and Green Berets. And I can tell you that the intensity of that, the training comes home and it results in a lot of violence with the people we love. And so there, there's, what I'm saying is for everyone listening, we are brought to an impasse so we will learn to listen to that which is bigger than us, but is really the bigger truth of us. And we have to be patient. And that's part of why I wanted to share your story so people can see there, you know, you went back for that fourth fight and it's, that's what it took to get you to the medicine. And the medicine said, okay, let me show you a picture of yourself. Let me show you how you manage polarity. And that had a wake up effect on you, but look at the magic that happened after that. And look at all the lives you've touched with your podcast through on it and all the work that you do that all came from that magic golden thread. And the other thing I was going to share is that there is multiple heroes journeys. There is not one hero's journey. As soon as you make through one hero's journey, great spirit says, good. I'll give you a little bit to rest. Go have some good <laughs> sex, smoke a joint, get drunk, do whatever you want to do, meditate under a tall tree, but don't be foolish enough to think that you're done mm -mm. because you're just learning how to be a hero, right? And more work to be done. Okay, so Kyle, it's been a fun journey so far. We are halfway completing the cycle of the hero's journey, and I'm digging this, baby. So thanks for sharing. I love getting inside a great athlete, great man's mind. We're at tests, allies, and enemies. Now finally out of his comfort zone, the hero is confronted with an ever more difficult series of challenges that test him in a variety of ways. Obstacles are thrown across his path. Whether they be physical hurdles or people bent on thwarting his progress, the hero must overcome each challenge he has presented on the journey towards his ultimate goal. The hero now needs to find out who can be trusted and who can't. He may earn allies and meet enemies who will, each in their own way, help prepare him for the greater ordeals to come. This is the stage where his skills and or powers are tested and every ob obstacle he faces helps us gain a deeper insight into his character and ultimately identify him with him even more. Tell us about the tests, the allies, and the enemies. We've heard about some of the tests. We've heard about a couple of the allies. Is there more tests, and who are some of the enemies, and what kind of challenges did they give you? Well, here we are. And I'm not just talking about guys <laughs> in the fighting ring. Those, I know. Those were, I, I know. Those were the ones that wasn't, you knew that about. That wasn't shit. Those uh, are the ones you expected. <laughs> you know, it's funny because sometimes we actively choose to call things upon us, right? Like, I mean, even just doing ayahuasca, there's a certain level of uncertainty and in entering into the unknown that takes some balls. Even yeah. as a lady, it takes some balls. You got to yeah. get in there. and um, you're, fearing, you're facing the unknown. You have yes. no way to control it. Exactly. So, but, but we do that knowing, and I do that knowing that there's a great potential for growth yes. in that. Um, so learning about those things first, then trying them and gaining the knowledge and wisdom that I have from them and the healing that has accompanied that makes me want to continue to do that work. And I have along with my wife, uh, one of the messages that I received in, in, plant ceremonies. I actually received it first in ayahuasca and received it again in, um, in psilocybin mushrooms about a year ago was to do an open relationship. Mm. And I understood this conceptually. I had read about it in books. Uh, Sex at Dawn was an incredibly powerful book that my wife and I read. Um, and got a very clear message. It seemed, you know, having a child that probably wouldn't be the best thing to do while parenting. 
Uh, but that was not the message I got a year ago with psilocybin. The message was, you will grow from this and you will be better people, better partners and better parents because of it, because of that growth, because of that healing and unpacking. And knowing that, you know, we started probably four months ago. And so we're, we're pretty young in it. And I've only recently started speaking about it because Fuck, there's a lot to unpack with that. There it's is not... a lot of surprises. And, and, and though you said you will grow from it and learn from it, uh, as a guy who's been on this path for 22 years, I've been, when, when I met Penny, I was very honest with her and said, look, I was married to a woman for 17 years in a monogamous relationship, and it did not work for either of us. It caused a lot of pain, a lot of stress, a lot of emotion ultimately led to infidelities based on our agreement that hurt us both, that took a lot to reconcile inside of myself. And I've seen many relationships destroyed with multiple partner attempts. Um, I've seen people just go sideways. It can trigger off drug use. It can trigger off uh, very damaging situations for the children that exist in the initial relationship. Um, I won't go into it all right now because I'd like to do another interview with you and Aubrey together where we really get into that mm -hmm. and you know look at it deeply and honestly and openly because I think a lot of young men are thinking with their dick and they think, oh, I'm I'm going to get lots of sex and all this, but it, they they are very very greenhorn and mm. don't have a clue. I always tell many of my students, you know, see how I live, and they go, oh, I'm going to do that too. And I'm like, I look them right in the eyes and I say, until you can ride one horse really well, don't try riding two at once because you can easily get split in half. And the thing that people often forget is you might like two women or three, but will they like each other? And your life isn't shitty until you have two women that don't like each other in the same fucking house. <laughs> so, uh, you, you know, tell me more uh, about the tests, the allies and the enemies, but I also want to hear about some of the uh, allies and enemies that thwarted your progress up to and including what we've covered so far because we never really got into the where was the resistance coming from for for a lot of fighters it's their family like, you're stupid why are you beating on people why are you getting hit in the head like that you know they don't see um, combat sports as intelligent means of engaging they can understand football because it's part of our culture but when when people close to you hear that you're fighting it usually they start telling you about you're going to get your brain ruined and there's so there's a lot of uh, resistance so i'm sure you got some of that yourself but uh, don't let me interrupt your flow i just wanted to interject because a lot of young people hear this and they get the wrong idea in their head so if you really want to learn about this wait for when kyle aubrey and i get into this full on so you can get a real education and you are right uh, multiple partner relationships are a rapid spiritual evolution process if you can stay in the game or they can be rapid trips to the edge of the wall that you once stood on. No doubt. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. There's wisdom already. <laughs> yeah, brother. Um, yeah, we don't need to dive too deep into that yet. We'll save that with Aubrey. But um, that certainly has been the most recent test. And it's, it's funny because, uh, you know, we had spoken about it for several years and a lot of triggers came up with jealousy and, and reasoning behind it, but eventually coming to a place of understanding our why yeah, and wanting to have more than one meaningful relationship that not only impacts our lives positively, but our partner's lives, you yeah. know, me having another brother, her having another sister, our our son and children to come to have more aunties and uncles, to have mm -hmm. more people that care about them. Mm -hmm. And right now, we've really cultivated that. We're really in a space where I've 
continue to learn about myself because all fear, all jealousy, all anxiety, all of these things are my work. And as I've done the work in my own realization of who I am and what I bring to the table and what kind of person I am, and also my own realization of trust in the relationship, trust in my wife, belief yeah. Yeah. in us as a family, yeah. knowing that I'm a great father and a great husband and a great lover, mm -hmm. that really solidifies the ground that I stand on mm -hmm. and allows me a certain degree of appreciation for what we have. You know, she chooses me actively, and I choose her actively, and not no because question, of some contract we sign. Yeah, there's no question that either of you have plenty of menu options. Uh, I mean, a lot of you will be listening to this, so you won't be able to see Kyle, but he's a Greek fucking god. I mean, this guy standing before you with not much clothes on, I'm a very heterosexual male, and I said to him one day when we were together, I tell you what, if I was a girl, I would just rape you right now. I just I would <laughs> run and jump and fuck your brains out because he's a big, handsome fucking stud, bar none, and his wife is a stone-cold fox. She's just gorgeous. That's just the fact. So your wife let loose in a room full of men won't last nine seconds, and you let loose anywhere you want to go won't last nine seconds before somebody wants to drain your main vein and all the other good stuff. So <laughs> Hopefully I'll last longer than nine seconds in the bedroom. Well, yeah, of course, <laughs> I, I, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I meant on the, on the menu as an open item, but, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, tell me, tell us a little more about some of the challenges you had with, you know, well, I think the, the allies and the enemies. Yeah. You know, what do you have to the work real, through? The real challenges were first and foremost what I thought of myself. That's that, always that the big came challenge. up. That came up in fighting, self confidence, belief yeah. in myself. Um, there wasn't too much resistance from my family. Mm -hmm. You know, my parents came and watched me fight. Uh, my mom didn't enjoy seeing me get my ass kicked as any mom would, but I had a lot of support mm -hmm. there. Um, Really, the big struggle was really getting paid table scraps. I mean, we lived in my mom's garage for fucking five years while I was while I was in the UFC fighting on TV. Wow, that's and, tough um, going, yeah. You know, working part time, twenty five, thirty hours a week up till three thirty in the morning, Friday, Saturday, Sunday night, just so I can put food on the table in between fights and. Um, not exactly the four doctor plan. Nope, not at all. Yeah, especially the more I was learning about health and wellness and the importance of sleep You're and like, Dr. Quiet. What am I, I doing like, to myself? Fuck, I don't know if this is worth it. <laughs> but, um, you know, thinking about those things, the resistance came really with uh, the financial discrepancy from what the UFC actually pays their fighters compared to how much they make. Yes, that's sad. Um, you know, and then... then the struggle of the environments I was in, you know, I, I, the thing I was doing that I loved was not putting food on the table. And the thing that was putting food on the table, I didn't love. I didn't love being in that environment in a strip club. Yeah. Uh, there were things I appreciated about it. I certainly appreciated the girls for putting up with horny ass dudes. Mm -hmm. I appreciated the horny ass dudes for <laughs> coming in and putting food on the table for me and for the girls. Yeah. Um, so I have gratitude for the experience, but it's not a fucking great environment, you know? No. So that was really where my resistance was. And I think the catalyst to want something better, to want to provide for my family, to want to stand on my own two feet, you know, not to be half suckling off mom's teeth and in her detached garage, but to have a house of our own, to have a career, to have all the things that we have today. Um, allies, Aubrey Marcus for fucking damn sure. Yeah. You know, Good. my best friend, uh, somebody who's really lifted me up and put me on a stage to be heard. Um, thank you, Aubrey. Yeah, many thank yous. Many thank yous to Aubrey. Um, Joe Rogan, too. He took, you know, he's, he's had many fighters on before, but um, yeah, he was really the first big break in terms of, uh, you know, having an ally that would give me a stage to speak on. And that, you know, really planted the seed moving forward for, for me podcasting, for me having a voice to share with the world. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as the enemies, the only enemy that I've had 
in the past year and a half has been my own mind. It's been my own fear and negativity. That's where I wanted to, to take you next. And I'm going to preface this by sharing an observation I made. When I had my experience that I talked about earlier, where I realized I had to take the gloves off and, and stop using violence as a tool to prove to myself the things I was trying to prove to myself, I looked at what it was that drove me to fight from the very beginning. And it was my father's violence. And it was the fear that he might kill one of us. I mean, there was broken bones in our house. There was blood. There was things that I don't even want to talk about that were just downright fucking scary that took me about a hundred ceremonies to heal. Um, stuff I would never wish on anybody. And I remember being a kid telling myself, I'm going to do whatever I have to do to get strong enough to kick this man's ass and teach him to stop beating on us. And so after I went through that spiritual crisis um, in the boxing ring, I just had to ask the fighters. There was 30 of us on the army boxing team. And I was the trainer at the time. I was also fighting, but I was the trainer of the team as well. And so once I came to this kind of clarity, I, I started our training session. I said, I want all of you to get in a circle. And we had a big wrestling mat, a proper wrestling mat with the circle painted on it. We used to use for a lot of different exercises. And I explained to them what had happened to me and why I was crying when many of them came to the training room and they were confused, like, why are you crying? You just freaking won the 82nd Airborne Division Championship, which for most doesn't sound like much, but of the 30 fighters on the boxing team, 28 of them were paratroopers. It's a, def it's a definitely different breed of animal to be a paratrooper. Um, I said, I came to the realization that I've been spending most of my life fighting because my father was so mean and so scary, I had to develop enough fighting strength and skill to take him out to protect my family if I had to. The question I have for all of you, all 29 of you, I was number 30 on the team, how many of you began your fighting career in order to protect yourself from your father? 28 hands went up. I realized that I did everything I did to become a fighter and to make myself tough, to protect myself against the man who was supposed to be protecting me in the world. Mm. I also learned as a fighter that I had to prove to myself that I was capable of overcoming my own fear and that I was as good as the other athletes that I respected. In other words, because I was a smaller kid when I grew up, I, you know, I'm only 5'8 and I never, I grew really slow in high school. I only weighed maybe 145 pounds and, uh, you know, I was very strong and I was fast, but compared to guys that, you know, when were big like you, it was tough going. And, and, you know, if they picked a fight with you, you better have your shit together because they hit hard. And so there was a lot of confronting my own fears. So, you know, you really hit the bullseye when you talk about your own fears. So what is it, what was it, what was it for you that you were needing to prove to yourself or come to grips with in yourself that ultimately led you to becoming a professional fighter and doing all these things? What were the demons you had to, yeah, that, to, to handle? I think there was, I didn't have a fear of my father at that point in my life when I started fighting. Uh, I mean, as a kid, for sure. But when I started fighting professionally, <clears throat> I still had a burning desire to beat the fuck out of people. You know, like that was, <laughs> that was the impetus to start. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse but me. But why? And um, Why? I think there was just a lot of unreconciled pain from my childhood. There was yeah. an, a lot of healing that needed to happen, and I had no real direction or guidance on how to do that. You know, as it would happen, fighting would lead me to the man that would help me with that, with mm -hmm. plant medicines. But, um, 
you know, it's it's kind of hard. It's kind of hard to fix something when you don't know what the issue is. Yeah. Like if I know nothing about cars and it breaks down and there's not even an engine light that comes on, I don't know what the fucking first thing to do is. Well, right? most people just kick their car. So there's a little <laughs> metaphor for you there, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. Right? You wanted to kick other people and people that don't like what their car's doing or their lawnmower's doing beat the shit out of it. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think a lot of it came down to me forgiving and this this happened you know over the course of many ayahuasca sessions but forgiving my parents realizing when i had a son three and a half years ago looked at my wife and i said i i'm a kid raising a kid it's you know? a real shift when your it's, child is born fuck man it is <laughs> i was only 18 i just turned 18 when my first son came into the world yeah an actual child raising a child yeah. and um so I had compassion for them. I understood immediately like, oh, my dad was the exact same age. He was a fucking kid. My mom was nine years younger. She was a child yeah. raising, raising kids. And there is no manual. There is no, and we, you know, we spoke a bit about that on, on the podcast we just did for Human Optimization Hour was there are some models, you know, yeah. Rudolf Snyder. There's various people that yeah. have it fucking dialed. But for the most part, it's not, I mean, unless you have a Paul check in your life, you're never going to hear about that guy. Our culture is so, lost in that way. Yeah. I think um, really looking back in hindsight with forgiveness and compassion for my family was a, was a, a great deal of the healing that took place surrounding how I was raised. And then mm -hmm. more has come up for me in the past year or so as my son has become the little animal that he is mm -hmm. as bear, mm -hmm. uh, how I discipline him brought back all the ways I was disciplined. Yes. That's a real, that takes a lot of conscious presence and awareness to you, you, I know you've probably had the experience of feeling this urge to give your kid a whack because nothing else seems to work. But then after you, you, you see how they respond to that and and it can put you into deep introspection is, mm -hmm. you know, and, and uh, I promised myself I wouldn't whack mana. Um, I did pretty good with Paul. I think I only spanked him twice in his childhood because my father beat us up so much. I just promised myself I wouldn't do that. But without parenting skills and living in a high stress environment with financial pressures and nobody to support you, you just don't have much left sometimes when you come home and even the people you love the most can push you past your capacity to, a, to, to stay connected would be the way. And so ha having spent a lot of time now studying um, attachment um, and adult attachment syndromes and, and the attachment process, and just learning how important it is to stay connected, I just said to myself again, I've only given Mana a couple of whacks because he's quite testy and uh, not, nothing to hurt him, just to let him know who, who the boss is in the house so that, because you know when they're young like that, they, they push your boundaries. Mm -hmm. That's part of their growing up. But I, I said to myself, okay, I've got to stay connected with him and just work with him and try to talk to him and let him know that, you know, there's certain things that you just can't do that's because it hurts other people or it's not fair. And it's hard to get that through a three-year-old's head, but it, I really felt this sense of gratification because he was going off and into quite a tantrum the other night. And I, I said, look, if you, if you don't calm down, Mona, we have to go outside because sometimes I'll take him out and then he'll... I'll take him to the end of the driveway. He'll try to run back into the house. And so I'll just catch him at the door and we'll just keep doing that till he's exhausted. And then mm. he says, I want to go to bed. And that's the end of it. But I don't want him to get a negative association with exercise because if he thinks it's a punishment, then he won't want to do it. Yeah. So I just sat with him and talked to him. And, and, and it took, you know, probably 35 or 40 minutes. I'm standing out there. It's cold. I got, you know, I'm not dressed to be outside. And, He's not dressed to be outside. I'm holding him close to my body to keep him warm. But he actually eventually softened and we kept eye contact. And I 
just realized I've, even at 57 years of age, I still feel the conditioning that my father gave me trying to jump out of me because it's, it's, we always resort on what we know most deeply when we're in the most stress or when we're losing control of a situation. That's just how the nervous system works. And I found myself feeling rewarded and saying, okay, that's it. I'm 57. I've got to do this. I've got to do the work. I think sometimes we don't have the patience to do the work to do real empathetic, compassionate, heart-centered parenting. And it does take a lot of patience. Uh, you know, so you're learning these things. Um, you're, you're making your way through all this. You're, you've learned a lot from the medicines. You learned a lot from the battles. Uh, it's interesting you didn't have that many enemies along the way, especially in the fight game, because my experience, like we were talking about on, uh, on a break, is that I was the only white guy on an all black and uh, boxing team with some Mexicans and Puerto Ricans. And everybody on my team was my enemy because of the color of my skin. I had never really experienced racism like that. And it was hard going mentally and emotionally to have the guys that you're supposed to be on a team with just hating you and wanting to get rid of you. But it's, it's amazing to me that you, your path didn't take you into much of that. It seems. Well, I mean, you could call Dana White the enemy for paying the guy's table scraps, but at the same time, if I was paid well, maybe I'd still be doing it. That's probably you know? true, yeah. So, um, and maybe there were some enemies in the bar and the environment that I was in, but, you know, I don't think, I don't think there was too much there. If I really well, think about it, the, the biggest enemy I ever had was myself. And I think, isn't it, don't you think at this time in your life, how old are you now, 39? 36. 36. Haven't you looked around and noticed that's about the case with almost everybody? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's why Jung's whole depth psychology process is based on one key principle, individuation, which means to become a whole individual in and of yourself. And to do that, you must confront your shadow. Mm. You must confront your parental programming. You must confront the parts of yourself you deny. And Jung makes it very clear, Adolf Hitler lives in you, the pedophile lives in you, the rapist, the murderer, the thief, everything that we project outside of ourselves and call bad or call evil lives right inside of us. And until we can find those in us, we're playing a very dangerous game with ourselves because we project that unconsciously onto others and, and crucify them. And... It's um, to, to become an individual in union psychology means to become whole. It doesn't mean that you act that stuff out. It means you acknowledge it. And that's one of the things that I think you would agree that, that plant properly run plant ceremonial medicine circles and, and healing ceremonies, they introduce you to those parts of yourself. You, you can meet the darkness, and most people call that a bad trip, but they don't realize the drug's not putting that in your head. Real psychedelic medicines amplify everything hiding inside you. They just turn the volume up so you can hear everything that you're denying in yourself. All is revealed. All is revealed. Uh, and and it, it can be hotter than a firewalk. Um, and it requires those of you who are listening, don't be foolish enough to think you're just going to run out and buy a bunch of mushrooms or some LSD because you can end up doing very, very stupid things and getting yourself in a lot of trouble. That's why people like me spend years of training and studying to become a medicine man, spirit guide, a shaman, uh, a journey leader. It requires skilled guidance because people do very dumb and very dangerous things on those medicines, especially in groups. But to finish my point, Jung's philosophy is until we are whole, we cannot guide anyone else to wholeness. Mm. And to be an elder, to be a leader, in a native culture, you would be an elder now, right? You wouldn't be a young man in the workforce. You'd be old enough that you probably might 
not want to go out and fight wars. You would be more valuable educating the young people and imparting wisdom to the tribe. And that's what the purpose of Living 4D with Paul Check is, is that's what this podcast is about, is imparting wisdom to the, the people in the world who can gain from anything that we're sharing. And when you reach that place of individuation, which in, in another way of saying is what in modern parlance, it's called enlightenment, but that word's been just tortured to death. Hmm. But one who is whole is enlightened. Drugs or no drugs, you know, because the journey to wholeness is probably the toughest journey we'll ever make. And that's what all this discussion is, isn't it? Yeah, brother. Every, every bit of this is about Kyle becoming whole. And then having that centeredness, you can look a young man in the eyes and tell him whether it's wise or not to get into a ring and find out what his motives are very quick. You can tell when someone's doing stupid things with drugs, alcohol, women, sex, money, because you've seen it all and lived through a lot of it yourself. And I think that the key point is the biggest challenge we have is inside of ourselves, but it's easy to blame it on everybody else. My daddy did this, my mommy, poor me. And the victim archetype just sings and dances until all of a sudden you wake up one day and you're 40 or you're 50 and you go, what the hell did I just do? I just pissed my life away and blamed it on my mommy and daddy and they haven't even been here for 25 or 30 years. So moving forward now, step seven is a good one. Approach to the innermost cave. The innermost cave may represent many things in the hero's story, such as the actual location, which lies a terrible danger, or an inner conflict, which up until now the hero has not had to face. As the hero approaches the cave, he must make the final preparations before taking that final leap into the great unknown. At the threshold to the innermost cave, the hero may once again face some of the doubts and fears that first surface on his call to adventure. He may need some time to reflect upon his journey and the treacherous road ahead in order to find the courage to continue. The brief respite helps the audience understands the magnitude of the ordeal that awaits the hero and escalates the tension and anticipation for his ultimate test. Where we've talked about a lot of your innermost caves, right? You've talked about the medicine journey. You talked about almost committing suicide. Um, what are some of the, are there any of the, are there any other challenges that fit the innermost cave where yeah. you might have talked yourself out, but you had to go into these dark places and, and really gather yourself? So again, I don't want to I don't want to take too much off the table for the conversation with Aubrey that we have coming up here in a month. But that's okay. Share what um, it feels natural to you because we're going to get way deep into that conversation. This this innermost cave most recently has really been, and this this certainly has had an ongoing theme throughout my life. But when I was ready to commit suicide, that fear of never being loved, of never ending up with somebody, of not being seen, of not being loved. That has been the thing that I've had to unpack in opening the relationship. That it is fear intense, of loss. Isn't it? it is like fucking nothing else. It's the ceremony that doesn't end. Yeah. It, you know, ayahuasca's got an eight hour time mark. Yeah. Uh, LSD's 10. Yeah. You know, DMT might be 15 minutes, but it fucking ends. Yes. It it does. Does. <laughs> this, this doesn't end. And so, really, as I said, having to sort through that really deep underlying fear that I will never find love, that I can never be loved. Yeah. And my own self-worth, that has been, I think, one of the biggest challenges I've had ever in my entire life, and it's resurfaced fully in this experience. Transcending that mm -hmm. has been one of the most pain-relieving fucking weightlifting, uh, amazing feelings that I've ever been a part of. Yeah. There's lots I would love to share right now because I would like to just... <laughs> and I can see you fucking chomping at the bit. Let me tell you, man, I have a <laughs> razor sharp axe ready to split that open, but I'm going to save it because okay. we're going to do, do surgery on this whole thing because I've spent 22 years on this path mm -hmm. and it's taken me in all sorts of interesting places in myself and 
been the source of a lot of deep meditation and conversations with God, my soul, and the door and the sauna, and every other damn thing. But it's good. Um, I'm going to save it. Okay. But those of you listening, stay tuned. Uh, I love this foreshadowing. We've yeah. been fucking fondling everyone's genitals right now, just getting them prepped for the next one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because uh, um, it's important for me that Aubrey goes on this fire walk. You with got us it. Too, you know, uh, I have therapeutic intentions. Um, the next is the ordeal. Um, the supreme ordeal may be a dangerous physical test or a deep inner crisis. The hero must face in order to survive, or the world in which the hero lives. Uh, Sorry, I'm going to read that again. Um, my ninth grade education shows now and then. The ordeal. The supreme ordeal may be a dangerous physical test or a deep inner crisis that the hero must face in order to survive or for the world in which the hero lives to continue to exist. In other words, if he doesn't face this ordeal, it's going to be hard for him to continue to exist. Whether it be facing his greatest fear or most deadly foe, the hero must draw upon all his skills and all his experience gathered upon the path to the inmost cave in order to overcome his most difficult challenge. And I will pause there and say, Joseph Campbell says, the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you need the most. So we'll preface the, your answer with that. Only through some form of death can the hero reborn, experiencing a metaphysical or a metaphorical re uh, resurrection that somehow grants him greater power or insight necessary in order to fulfill his destiny or reach his journey's end. This is the high point of the hero's story where everything he holds dear is put on the line. If he fails, he will either die or his life as he knows it will never be the same again. Now, we have talked about several ordeals, the most current one being this transition into multiple partner relationships. You've talked about the ordeal of really overcoming your own shadow, right? Your own mm -hmm. fears, which I would also point out and this isn't talked about so much in a lot of the kind of fluffy new age shadow stuff out there. What we call our shadow is not just our shadow. It is our parent's shadow. It is our society's shadow. It is our religious affiliation shadow. It is our cultural shadow. And it is the shadow of people across the world throughout time. And myths are chalk a block with this stuff. So I'm saying that what I'm really saying is that what Kyle had to face is in all of us in some way, shape, or form. It might be a slightly different manifestation. It's different for a woman sometimes. It's different from, uh, you know, different regions of the world. But at the, at the bare, very core of it, we're all having to deal with the weight of being human. And there, there's... And, and a human beings kind of in a predicament because we have an animal body. Our bodies are built on the platform that's clearly outlined. If you study comparative anatomy, evolutionary biology, I mean, anybody that doesn't agree that we human beings are in animal bodies is just purely uneducated or so dogmatic that they can't even look at the truth. But within us, the human being with its the size of brain to body mass it has and the capacity of the, the uh, prefrontal cortex and the neocortex to go beyond traditional animal instinctual living, um, it brings us into a situation where we become conscious at some point that there's something beyond us within us, thus the awareness that something's guiding us along, that's there but invisible. Call it what you will. Um, there, I've studied the history of God, and one of the things that comes up in the study of when did people start coming to this concept of God 
one of the proposals that I thought was quite good that I studied was that there came a time in our evolution when we killed another human being but realized we didn't have to do it and all of a sudden became aware that we had an option not to kill but saw ourselves doing it anyhow and all of a sudden realized that we don't have to act out the animal urge to defend or to kill but we that there is something else inside of us witnessing this mm. and that was the theory that led to say that something else witnessing what we're normally trapped in as unconscious animal behavior brings us aware and our brain structures are powerful enough to give us this top-down view of ourselves. H have you had that experience of, of seeing yourself in the moment doing things and saying, I'm doing this and I don't know why I'm doing it because I know I shouldn't be doing it? Yeah, I've done, I mean, I've had the... I don't know why I'm doing this and I shouldn't be doing this. And yet I am. I've done that with food. I've done that with bad drugs. I've done that uh, with sexual partners that I had no interest in staying with or having anything, any type of meaningful relationship with. Um, and I've also seen that on the flip side, you know, I've, I have felt like I'm in a place like, man, I'm not sure how I got here or why I'm here, but it feels right. You know, it feels like, like if I can listen to that inner voice and drop in, then I can be guided to what's next. Mm -hmm. And whatever that is, that's whatever the work that needs to be done, that's the work of the day, whatever's right in front of me. Yeah. And I think it's easier for me to wrap my head around that if I'm listening. Mm-hmm. So that's one the, of the secret, isn't it? That is the secret. And one of the things you talked about in this section was, you know, what what are the tools that you rely on to dig your way out? Mm -hmm. And I've had to rely on every single tool I have, many of which come from you. Qigong, hey. the zone exercises, Tai Chi, walking meditations, yeah. uh, breath work. Yeah. All those things allow me to center myself because sitting still while you're under a lot of stress. It's hard, yeah. That's fucking hard, right? Yeah, Especially not, if I'm not. We're not from the Oriental culture. <laughs> yeah. We're not subservient that way. Yeah. So I think, if and, and, and just physically having like, if there's fucking stored emotion in my body, and there is, I need to physically express that. Yeah. And it needs to be done in a way that's life-affirming, life-building. Working in, not working out, right? I'm not, I've got my energy expenditure down to a science. I know how to train mm -hmm. without overdoing it, but do I know how to build? So I think really leaning heavily on all the tools from what I just mentioned to plant medicines to even microdosing, mm -hmm. um, not on a hedonic calendar as they describe in stealing fire where i have a fucking calendar list of every day that i'm going to do medicine but yeah. really when i feel called to it being able to lean on those things and gain perspective to gain new insight to gain the wisdom using flotation tanks to yeah, really drop in uh, just that, 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 fucking I, amazing i think that's the where people should start before they get into psychedelics myself for sure well that's and that's the whole thing is can i sit with myself Yes, that's you know, it. That the fucking from all the young age from getting into pot and booze and coke and all these things is because I didn't feel comfortable in my own skin. Yes. Remember that's right? one of the key questions a shaman asks. When did you stop being comfortable being alone with yourself? Mm -hmm. What when I, you know, I want to ask this question again in a different angle. Maybe I can pull an answer out of you. What do you think has been the scariest thing you've had to face or the cave you feared to enter most that ultimately is kind of like the keystone that if that one thing is effectively addressed, then all these other challenges and things are secondary because if that one thing is handled, then there's no impetus to these other things. Self-love. Self-love. Yay, Without baby. a doubt. Because that answers the question of will I ever be loved? It does, doesn't it? It doesn't need to be external. It comes from within. You know, there's uh, 
one of my favorite books is is uh, Mastery of Love by Don Miguel Ruiz. And my wife and I have been reading that each night. We read a chapter out loud to each other. Right. And he, he has this chapter, I think it's chapter six, called The Magical Kitchen. Mm-hmm. I wasn't... <laughs> I wasn't sure when I'd get choked up in this conversation, but I knew it would happen. Well, that's good. And the Thank Magical Kitchen for sure. is this place where you never run out of food. Mm-hmm. You have food, you bring friends over, you serve it to them, you give them your food. That is your love. You never run out of food. It's always there. It's infinite. And then one day, someone knocks on the door, and it's a pizza delivery man. And he says, hey, I'll give you this pizza. If you're hungry, but you have to do whatever I say, you have to do whatever I want you to do. And then I'll continue to give you this pizza every day. You would, you know, you have the magical kitchen and you're like, why the fuck would I do that? I'm not going to take that deal. I've got unlimited food. You want to come in and eat? Was his name Donald Trump? <laughs> <laughs> so that is the idea behind love. Yeah. Our hearts, that is the magical kitchen. Yeah. It is unlimited love. We are beings of light and love. Yes. That God is love, and we are yeah. of that source. All is of or nothing is. It's one of my favorite quotes from Paul Selig. We are of that divine love, mm-hmm. and it comes from within. It's the wellspring from within. And if I can tap into that, that is know thyself. That is knowing what is inside me. And if I can bring that to the surface and cultivate more of that, that's infinite. I can give that to anyone. Mm-hmm. I can give it freely without a need for return and without a need for external validation or external love or external things. And as that comes to me, then it's a gift. It's not a requirement or a necessity. That's what a saint is. Somebody who can love you even when you're torturing them. Now, <clears throat> Osho says in his lectures, because I've studied Osho extensively, he says the beauty of love is that it never works. And what confuses people about that is they don't really understand what he means. What he means is, as long as you expect someone else to give you love and make you happy and make you feel good, it'll always lead to codependency and problems and relationships that ultimately lead to more pain and friction than connection and love. But when we learn to truly love ourselves, we make love every day. And when we know that we love ourselves and we can love ourselves and we grow to be able to stay loving, empathetic, and compassionate with ourselves through challenges, even challenges where we're disappointed with ourselves and realize the higher part of us, the the soul nature of us can parent ourselves. In other words, we have the best mother and the best father in the universe inside of us, Mm -hmm. right inside of us, metaphorically in our heart. And if we don't learn to love ourselves, then we have to beat people up. We have to steal shit. We have to do lots of drugs. We end up expecting others to make us happy. We blame mommy and daddy for everything wrong in our lives. And the list is very fucking long and it costs billions of dollars in drugs and surgeries in this world every day and every year. So ultimately, that is the the deepest cave, and that is the ultimate hero's journey. Why do you think the universe made it such a challenging quest? (laughs) Uh, I don't know, and I don't know that it is, because, you know, a lot of the things that people would be averse to or really be like, you know, and, and sure, that's happened. You know, there's been plenty of times when I was fighting where people would be like, what's that like? What's it like getting hit in the head? It's like, oh, I don't, it doesn't bother me. I get to hit someone else in the head. You know, yeah. it's, that, that, that might be harder for some people to wrap their head around, but the challenge, the work, there's beauty in all of it. If I can just see it for what it is. Mm-hmm. Everything that I've gone through, all the, all of the, <clears throat> the hardest experiences have been the most beautiful, the most transformative. Yeah. I mean, just look at ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. For sure, one of the hardest teacher plants. And 
every ceremony I've had has been transformative and healing and given me insight and new perspective and allowed me to, to see the world with new eyes, to be born again. You know, for lack of a better term, but really. Well, to, that's what it is. Yeah. And I think um, in any of those experiences, whether they're fighting, I mean, there's certain hindsight is twenty twenty, and there's no doubt I can look back on every single thing that I've gone through with immense fucking gratitude. Yeah. I think the reason that it's uh, a challenging path is because one, it creates time. If it happened too quickly, one, it wouldn't be that valuable. Two, the quality of the experience would diminish. Imagine if there was a way you could become a millionaire in five days. Well, everybody would be a millionaire and it wouldn't mean anything anymore. But the path to being a millionaire for most people is, you know, the, there's an old saying, an overnight success only takes 20 years, and it's true. But I think it makes it meaningful. Um, and I think also it takes time because the depth of the human psyche is infinite. It, we are very complex beings. And look, I've studied my ass off for a very long time. And the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. And it's taken me a long time in my life to get to the point where I can honestly go into that inner space in myself and say, dear soul, guide me, because I do not know the answer. I don't know how many men's 55 plus chewable vitamins I should take today. <laughs> I don't know how many carrots I should eat. I don't know if I should eat an animal. I don't know if I should be a vegetarian today. I don't often even know how the best to parent my kid. I got all this knowledge, but look, there's a every expert on every side of the fence from Jordan Peterson, who says, whack the little sucker and show him who's boss, to uh, Hazrat Inyat Khan, a Sufi master, who says, Take your time, act from your heart, be patient, and treat that child exactly how you'd want to be treated if you were that child. And that takes tremendous development as a human being to be able to parent that way. And most people don't have that level of development. So when you get to the point where you can actually say, hey, I'm a smart guy, but I don't know shit, we get reminded of... Socrates and the Oracle of Delphi said he was the wisest man in the world and he regularly admitted how often he didn't know, right? And that for the ego is a big death threat to say I don't know, you know? So we get all this intellectualization and I'm an expert because I read a few articles or I have a PhD but I've never really done anything but sit in a classroom and listen to other people talk. So the, we've, we've gotten some great juice out of the innermost cave. Let's go to eight, the ordeal. The supreme ordeal may be da a dangerous physical test or a deep inner crisis the hero must face in order to survive in the... Oh, we already talked about that. Mm -hmm. We got okay, through so the ordeal. We're, we got the or we've, ta we've talked about some ordeals now. Kyle, I'm getting to know you right here, baby. I mean, I thought I knew you, but I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm falling even deeper in love with Deep you, baby. Dive. Yeah. I know I'm safe with you, man. Um, nine, reward, seizing the sword. After defeating the enemy, surviving death, and finally overcoming his greatest personal challenge, the hero is ultimately transformed into a new state, emerging from battle as a stronger person and often with a prize. The reward may come in many forms, an object of great importance or, po or power, a secret greater knowledge or insight, or even reconciliation with the loved one or ally. Whatever the treasure, which may well facilitate his return to the ordinary world, the hero must quickly put celebrations aside and prepare, prepare for the last leg of his journey. We've talked about some of them, but if you had to summarize, what have been some of the rewards 
on your quest into the across the threshold into the cave dealing with the enemy even if it was within what are some of the rewards tell the young men and the young women of the world what you walked away with that represents the rebirth the new you the more loving the more capable more reliable more spiritual man yeah belief in oneself trust faith all all on the opposite end of the spectrum from living in fear anxiety and anger and as a guy who's only 36 years young there is plenty more development in store for me and there's certainly will be times where i get angry and i have fear but having the tools to get quiet to sit with myself to feel and to source where is that originating from yes that allows critical. me that allows me to to give it awareness to bring light to the darkness and shine light on the shadow and as i do that it just fucking evaporates it it allows me yeah. to move through it and i think there's a there's an idea and i heard this first from parangi and and aubrey um Prongy's a shaman that uh, works with Kyle and Aubrey, just so everyone knows who he's and, talking about. And a about. musician. Beautiful musician. fucking yeah, musician. Yeah, he's a very good musician. Um, Especially with his nose flute. <laughs> that's right. But it's this idea of the buffalo, the buffalo medicine. Yeah. So the buffalo, when they have a storm coming, they don't try to outrun the storm. They get shoulder to shoulder with their family, and they go head first into the storm. Mm -hmm. And when they come out on the other side of that, they move through it the fastest way. Mm-hmm. And so that's really how I've sourced my fear mm -hmm. is to move through it head on. And I think in doing that, um, not only does it empower me because I don't have to run from this thing or try to not see it and not face it. If I face the fear and move through it, that gets me to level up that much faster. That gets me to a place of peace and contentment and enjoyment much faster. You know, one of the guys I studied a lot when I was a younger man, um, I would say probably in my um, late 20s, uh, early 30s, was Zig Ziglar. Are you familiar with him? Mm -hmm. Well, Zig Ziglar has a beautiful acronym for fear, false evidence appearing real. Haven't you found in your own quest that a lot of the stuff that really altered your behavior or your relationship with yourself and others when you did get centered and look honestly at it was false evidence appearing real yeah it's all bullshit fear as ted decker says fear is an is an illusion yeah and there is no fear in love yeah if i'm living in fear i'm not living in love yeah so that is a guiding light for me to sort my shit if i feel fear if i feel anxiety if i feel anger i'm not living in love in that moment yeah. So let's take a look at that. Where does that stem from? What is this thing? And one, it's I'm batting a thousand, one hundred percent of the time. Yeah. When I've looked at that fear, it hasn't been real. Even yeah. the fear of, of getting my ass kicked in a fight in the UFC. It, it's was that the end of my career when I lost? No. Did it move me that much further down the ladder in respect to the trying to win a championship? No. Like there. Did I die? No. Like, there's no, you know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. the worst possible outcome never actually manifests that way. Yeah. It never does. Whatever my preconceived notion or fear wrapped around that thing is, it's always 100 times worse than what actually happens. Yeah. You know, a lot of people think fear is, is the opposite of love, but it really isn't. If God is love, then everything is love. In the system that I teach my students in their holistic lifestyle coach training, um, fear is just a, a highly polarized form of love. It's like being in the outer edges of a tornado where the winds are blowing hard enough to drive straw through trees. Um, as you go from sex and what I call sex and violence loving to conditional loving, it's like moving toward the eye of the storm. And then you grow from I love you if, when, and, or but to empathetic and compassionate love. Now you're getting very close and, and there's houses flying around all around, flying to pieces and 
death happening all around you, but you're sitting in this safe place because you're able to look and see the truth and the beauty of even the parts of yourself that once looked ugly because now you know they're part of a process. The eye of the storm is the highest form of love, which is unconditional love. And that is the spiritual path, is to make it from fear and enemies and judgments to realizing that learning to love better means getting clear on what conditions you need to create and establish in relationships openly and honestly so that you can practice loving more. But then you get to the point where you're at right now in about 36 to 40, it takes most people to look around and say, oh my God, that kid that just stole that car, I used to be him. That guy that just slapped his girlfriend, I either used to be him or I know that part of myself, I have to hold it back. Mm. And so you start to realize that you are everybody and that everybody is you. And so then you have empathy and compassion. And this is why Osho said, if we were really honest about our justice system, we would realize that the people we've locked up are acting out their parental programming and their social programming, and we should lock their parents up, which means we'd have to lock their grandparents up, and we'd have to lock great-grandma, and everybody in the world would be in fucking jail. So we have a sort of an unjust justice system because it's really taking the people off the street that we don't want to look at because it reminds us too much of the parts of ourselves we want to deny. But... When we have empathy and compassion, then we go into the prisons or into the areas of dysfunction and we lend our love to that. And one of the most rewarding things in my life is that I've donated a number of uh, Eat, Move, and Be Healthies and Scientific Back and Scientific Core to prison systems just out of the goodness of my heart. And a number of prisons have bought them for their uh, training programs for guys that are about ready to get out of prison. And I've gotten amazing and beautiful letters from prisoners who studied my stuff and wanted to become a personal trainer or a check train professional. And that's when I felt like I have now found that part of myself that needs some love. And, and I think one of the messages I want to share is that you don't have to go do free counseling, but if there's something you can give those people, like I gave correspondence courses and I give books away, that's the kind of love I can give with my schedule, my family, and the demands on myself. And I think it's up to each one of us to figure out how we can love back. Mm. Even if it's just sitting in meditation and opening our heart and saying, this love I'm sending out is for all the people in the world that need love right now, and it's free. And that's one way a human being can love unconditionally, and it's phenomenal practice. I, I find that I grow so much by sitting in my sauna and just opening my heart chakra as wide as I can and l loving 360 and just practicing loving everyone and everything. And in my study of world religion, I was so impressed with the Sufis because the first principle of Sufism is there is no God but God. I love everyone and everything. And that is a very, very high form of love. And to have that as the first principle in a religious philosophy that's a long way from onward Christian soldiers marching off to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. Yet most Christians think Muslims need to be removed from the planet. And of course, Muslims think the same thing. And this is that sex and violence loving that's all really a part of the hero's journey that we're all talking about right now, isn't it? Mm -hmm. the, the Part of the grand message I'm trying to share is I'm sharing Kyle Kingsbury because he's a legitimate badass dude who's faced his fears and walked into those scary caves, stepped on the snakes, been bitten, healed himself. And this is about saying to you, all of us are on this journey. All of us have this to heal. Everything Kyle's talked about, everything I've talked about, every one of you listening has this stuff to deal with. And if you think you don't, I'll quote Laird Hamilton, you need to go sit for a long time under a very tall tree. <laughs> now, we are 
at stage 10, the road back. This stage in the hero's journey represents a reverse echo of the call to adventure in which the hero had to cross the first threshold. Now he must return home with his reward, but this time the anticipation of danger is replaced with that of a claim and perhaps vindication, absolution, or even exoneration. But the hero's journey is not over and may still need one last pushback into the ordinary world. The moment before the hero finally commits to the last stage of his journey may be a moment in which he must choose between his own personal objective and that of a higher cause. You've, you're clearly on the road back. Where is the personal objective and where is the higher cause for Kyle right now? Or is it one or the other? Well, the personal objective has been sorting my shit. It's doing my own self-work. It's continuing that work. It's knowing that it's, it is a never-ending growth process that, that doesn't have any endpoint in sight. And the higher cause in healing myself is to share that medicine with the world. It is to deliver the medicine of play and laughter and not taking shit so seriously. Yes. And and self-love. <clears throat> and maybe disregarding, and then that doesn't have to be my way, doesn't have to be your way, but maybe starting to take down, tear down some of the walls and ideologies and dogma and, and conditioning that we've been programmed with and figuring out the different ways that we can do that so that we can live the life of our dreams and sharing that with other people. And I just want to reiterate something I shared earlier, but I think it's important to share it again. If you can't do it for yourself, do it for the world because your shit is our shit. Your shit is mom and dad's shit. Your shit is governmental shit. Your shit is the shit of a dysfunctional education system. Your shit is the shit of a military-industrial complex that promotes nationalism, so we will get behind war efforts that aren't really legitimate threats. They're just ways to sell more weapons and more crap. We each, as individuals... When we heal ourselves, we break a link in the genetic transformation or the genetic transfer of pain and confusion. And so it's just important for all of us, I think, to remember that we are not just doing this for ourselves because sometimes, as you would probably squarely admit, it's a tough road. It can be feel very alone, you, you know, especially when you're in a deep medicine journey. It's just you and God and Sometimes it's more you than God. <laughs> and, but, you know, if you look at the book, It Didn't Start With You by Mark Wu Lin, and you see all the current science on how there are at least three generations they can track scientifically, we're carrying the weight of no less than three generations of uh, family stuff. We look at the genetics of, you know, we know we're prone to addiction if our parents were addicted and our grandparents were addicted or anyone we know we carry the uh, a, a tendency toward cancer if there's cancer in our prone tree. to fear if your parents experience ptsd yes. holocaust survivors everything all of it everything and you know this can be easily understood in a different light by studying um rupert sheldrick's morphogenic field concept which is another topic but it's very powerful because it's related to this but the you know, the the real issue that is just that we're working for each other and that when we heal one of those things, we reduce the likelihood of more violence in our children. We reduce the likelihood of more addiction in our children. We reduce the likelihood of more disease in our children. And our children will be the people running the world tomorrow. And And that's where each of us can prop ourselves up, I think. You know, wouldn't it be easier for you knowing that your healing is the world's healing instead of doing it for yourself? I know it does for me. That's why I do all this. I honestly come to work every day. I study. 
anyone that knows me or spends time with me can tell you I'm a very disciplined human being. And when a lot of people are watching TV and picking their nose, I'm growing and developing and practicing and meditating and doing things that other people don't do. Why? Because I, I feel the responsibility to the world. And I clearly see that you do as well. Thank you, brother. Hey, you're getting tired on me over there. <laughs> we're almost done. Now we're at resurrection. This is the climax in which the hero must have his final and most dangerous encounter with death. The final battle also represents something far greater than the hero's own existence, with its outcome having far-reaching consequences to his ordinary world and the lives of those he left behind. If he fail fails, others will suffer. And this not only places more weight on his shoulders, but in a movie, grips the audience so that they too feel part of the conflict and share the hero's hopes, fears, and trepidation. Ultimately, the hero will succeed, destroy his enemy, and emerge from the battle cleansed and reborn. Or not. <laughs> uh, where would you say your resurrection has come most? Hmm. It's certainly come in the plants, it's come in belief in my own self, and it's come in, in knowing myself and having self-love. How does that feel? Well, the initial feeling was relief, like, oh, oh okay, I'm okay, I'm okay, it's okay. Yeah. And then from there, there's a lightness to life. Yes. You know, like everything seems to flow. Uh, one of the intentions I had a year ago in ceremony was was, was actually Aubrey's. It was Wu Wei. Mm -hmm. And understanding that never-ending dance of life mm -hmm. is easier if I dance and I move with it rather than rigidly opposing yeah. the things that come towards me. Wu Wei means not action for those people not familiar with way wu may way wu way means action not action wu way means not action doing not doing which is paradoxical for people but really it means acting from your heart and your higher self not your ego or following the flow of spirit or gaia yeah or that which is greater than you yeah i think unpacking resistance to any challenge with acceptance and appreciation and then moving into enjoyment and enthusiasm about life. I mean, that's, that's the goal for anything. And I think that's, as I surrender into what is, mm -hmm. it makes everything else fucking easier. You know, one of the things that Penny and I were excited to find that we had in common when we met and um, began our relationship together 22 years ago now was that we both had studied a lot of Napoleon Hill, and I spent a lot of time studying Napoleon Hill, and I, I really think he added a lot of value to my life. But Napoleon Hill says, behind every cloud of gray is a silver lining. And isn't really that what you're sharing right now? But you just have to be patient enough and stay conscious enough to decide to look for the silver lining instead of focusing on the cloud of gray. That's it, brother. You are now at step 12. We are about to close the circle on the hero's journey. I can't promise you that this is going to be the end because the circle doesn't actually close. It is a spiral that goes from earth to heaven, and heaven has no ceiling, so it goes forever and <laughs> ever and ever because God has nothing else to do but experience God, and we're it. Twelve, return with the elixir. This is the final stage of the hero's journey in which he returns home, or she, forgive me, girls, with all this he stuff, which in which he or she returns home to his ordinary world, a changed man or woman. He will have grown as a person, learned many things, faced many terrible dangers, and even death, but now looks forward to the start of a new life. His return may bring fresh hope to those he left behind, a direct solution to their problems, or perhaps a new perspective for everyone to consider. That's the whole point of this podcast and yours and our lives. 
The final reward that he obtains may be literal or metaphoric. It could be a cause for celebration, self-realization, or an end to strife. But whether, but whatever it is, it represents three things. Change, success, and proof of his journey. The return home also signals the need for resolution for the story's other key players. The hero's doubters will be ostracized, his enemies punished, and his allies rewarded. Ultimately, the hero will return to where he started, but all things will clearly never be the same again. So, if I hear Kyle correctly, see if I've been listening, <laughs> the elixir that you've returned with is a deeper, more honest, more clear love and appreciation for yourself. And in that, it seems to me that you are capable of offering your wife more freedom, even though it's scary. And she obviously is on this hero's journey with you, so she has some big ovaries. Her ovaries have to match your kahunas. Mm -hmm. So, Natasha, I'm proud of you. <laughs> um, you have become a father, and you've came to the realization that your mom and dad loved you the best they could and that life is just not such an easy walk and we don't realize that until we become parents. You've learned that medicines are very powerful teachers, but I want to make a key point here because a lot of people think medicines do the fixing. They don't. Mm -hmm. They show you where the work is at. They don't take you by the hand and say, now you've got to love better tomorrow. They say, this is an opportunity for you, but you have to go through the door. You have to cross the threshold. Because I see a lot of people coming out of ceremonies talking lolly, lolly, golly, golly, like Jesus and the prophets, but two weeks later, they're the same village idiot they ever were because they fall right back into their pro programming and they don't do the work. So the medicines are like having a deep, vivid dream that show you what your possibilities are, but they do not do the work for you. Haven't you found that to be true? Oh, 10,000%. You know? Yeah, absolutely. So you see, the hero's journey, the medicines are really the cave we fear to enter most because we have no control in there and we don't know what the gremlins are but we have got to do the work and clearly you are doing the work. So wouldn't it be a bit of an interesting paradox to say that the work is the elixir? You see my point? Yeah. Like most people think, oh, the elixir, it's like the prize, right? Yeah. It's the girl, it's the money, it's the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. But the reality of it is 98% of people that win the lotto are broke a year later and say they wished it had never happened. Why? Because they didn't do the work. If you can't manage 35,000 a year, you can't manage a million either because you haven't done the work to learn how to manage that much energy. So you have learned to face yourself. You've learned to love yourself. You've learned to trust your wife and yourself to go outside the confines of a traditional Christian westernized ideology of what a relationship or a marriage is supposed to be. You've learned that there's people along the way that will help you stop farting and <laughs> get your abdominals to work correctly and breathe better. You've learned that there are people in strange places that take you for sweat lodges and introduce you to medicines that open you up. You've learned that sometimes to prostitute yourself as a bouncer in a bar or a stripper or whatever is a necessary means, but the most important thing to make that a viable investment and not fall into the victim archetype is to be focusing on what it is that you really want to do that is a better expression of your love. Have I missed anything? Spot on, brother. I love you. <laughs> I know this has been a long podcast, but I think it's very, very important. And compared to life and how long you will have to walk to get these lessons, this has been a flash in the pan. I love you, man. I love you, brother. <laughs> I'm proud of you. Thank you. 
And thanks for joining me. And thank you to Ryan for your technical support and your patience. Thank you to Penny for feeding us and keeping us warm and loved. And thank you, Natasha, for supporting Kyle in his journey and he in your journey. Uh, you guys, Natasha is here in the house with us, just so you know, I'm not talking to a ghost. <laughs> and thank you to all of you for being on this journey with us. We do love you because we are you and we feel your love, whether you know it or not, because we are you and you are us. So a whole great spirit. Kyle, until we meet again and do another podcast, continue being the perfect Kyle Kingsbury. I'll try my best. Love you. <laughs> I love you, brother. Uh -huh. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Kyle Kingsbury.